Charles McKenzie, space again, gets the pass away for Lamb Welcome to the All Light Podcast, brought to you by Vodafone, and I'm your host, Robert Dunn. Heaps to get through today as we talk some super footy review. North South, which has already sold over 30,000 tickets, the passing of one of New Zealand's great rugby men. And in the studio, we have a guest who is pulling together one of the most eclectic rugby CVs that you have ever seen. Welcome to the studio, Glenn Jackson. Roundy, awesome to be here, mate. Thanks very much. Uh, wonderful little spot up here in Auckland, but different to old uh, Youngson Road and Fokamarama. So well done, mate. No, I appreciate you uh, coming up the uh, State Highway, mate, to to uh, join us. And uh, firstly, mate, when you look at the CV, as I said in the intro, 100 games of first-class rugby for the Bay and the Chiefs, over 100 games abroad for Saracens, one of the leading clubs up there now, over 100 games as a first-class referee, and now, recently announced, you're a part of the... Uh, Fiji coaching team. How did that come about, mate? Oh, pretty lucky, really, mate. Uh, you know, the head coach is Vern Cotter, so he was back in the day at Bay of Plenty when we won the Shield. Um, he was the head coach there, so so he took over Fiji uh, beginning of this year and put together a pretty good coaching setup, apart from me just slipping in there. So uh, pretty lucky, like Daryl Gibson's part of it, Jace Ryan, so, you know, he's put together some pretty good guys, and obviously we all know how exciting Fiji is in terms of a place and and the potential they've got as rugby players. So, uh, mate, really looking forward to it, and and a pretty good change of career, really, from the coaching, uh, from refereeing to the coaching. Absolutely. Was that, um, you know, when you hung up the whistle last year, was coaching a part of the plan, or it's something that has just evolved, um, an opportunity that popped up that you couldn't turn down? Like, how did it all come about? Uh, you know, it was cer- certainly in the plan, like uh, to Puna under-13s, was my uh, still doing <laughs> yeah. that, so that's pretty exciting. And then uh, doing the Bay under-19s, but uh, gave up the whistle. I just had a hip replacement, so I sort of went through that sort of process. And, uh, you know, the body was a bit shagged to carry on refereeing. And thank goodness with Super Rugby the way it's going, <laughs> it's pretty tough work for those boys in the middle. But uh, then to roll into um, some coaching was, was always part of the plan. Uh, was it Fiji? Definitely not. You know, like to, to go to something like that is just... Surreal, really, you know. So uh, hopefully we can have a good group for four years and take them to the World Cup. And um, you know, if we can get things right with that country, you know, like uh, it's just phenomenal depth there. You know, and we, if anyone's been there, you see them playing rugby all day long in the streets with a coke can with anything. You know, they're just playing footy. So uh, to to try and get something together there and, and get them over the line would be awesome. It would be awesome. And so what did just Vern jumped on the phone and said, Jacko, um, you know, we need you to perform this particular role for us? was he? Has that already been decided, sort of how you're going to uh, be a part of the coaching group? Yeah, I had a pretty serious interview with him. He stood up and said, what's your philosophy on coaching? I was like, shit, that's a good question. And then uh, he said, right, yeah, let's do it. So I was like, oh, that's a good good little interview. So um, it was pretty good. Um, uh, Duncan Sandlett sort of was helping me around that. So uh, getting through that and then, um, you know, it was t- – and then he just said, look, we need help with kicking. Some of their kicking is uh, in the stats of the World Cup. Hasn't been their strength. Um, Twelve yellow cards in four games at the World Cup. So I think the background, of the refereeing, is trying to change that sort of philosophy, and then uh, just a bit of skill work. So um, that's the sort of the roles that I've I've got to try and take with them. And um, you know, again, I think kicking's kicking's a major in, in terms of how rough footy's played at the moment. And and the Fiji, we don't want to really make sure they're kicking all the time because that's not how Fiji play. But they certainly need to, uh, spe- especially off the tee, sort of incre- increase their performances around that. Yeah, awesome. And as you are. Uh as you hinted at, um, just before, you know, what is it? There's a million or a little bit more than a million people in Fiji, but it seems like every one of them is built to play rugby, and it doesn't matter whether you're watching uh, grassroots footy um, on a Saturday or, or watching the, the grassroots footy show on Sky or whether you're watching uh, super rugby teams, whether you're watching rugby up north, there is always two or three very, very handy Fijians. Um, is the challenge bringing them together, because they are everywhere. They are literally um, the Harlem Globetrotters of world rugby. You find them almost in every team in every corner. Huge challenge, Randy. Um, you know, if you look at the World Cup from uh, two years ago, or last year, whenever it was, to, um, you know, most of them were based in Europe. Um, I talk about the band of 19s. So I think we've got five Fijians, and you sort of ask them, and, and they want to go and play for New Zealand, you know. So I think the, the real exciting thing is to try and want want. Fijians to play for Fiji, and if we can get that over the line, then we can pick from many, many corners of the world. Because, uh, as you said, you know, uh, Fiji rugby's pretty, pretty strong in the in the island, oh. but it's not where they're making money. So they they travel to make money. The the dream is to play for the All Blacks, and if we can get just a bit of change of attitude, I think, and, and want them to play for Fiji because they're going to have fun and they're a winning culture and a winning team. So 
that that's part of the, the, the philosophy that we're sort of aiming for. So um, if we can drag people together, it would be great. Um, uh, going ahead this year, if everything goes ahead, we've got we've got a couple of games in um, Fiji with the Pacific Nations Cup, and then up to this really exciting Eight Nations. So uh, we'll sort of go from two teams around that because a lot of players are based in Europe. So it's uh, it's just it's a great great timing. Mate, so much going on and so much uncertainty, but there could be some really ex- exciting schedules getting uh, put in the calendar down here um, in the Southern Hemisphere and also um, up north. Talk a little bit more about um, that Eight Nations Festival that's being um, potentially put together right there. You've got a tough pull by the looks of it, Jacko, if, um, if it, as it stands at the moment anyway. Yeah, I mean, really exciting from World Rugby putting this together. Uh, it's the Six Nations plus uh, Japan and Fiji. Uh, split into two pools and then you play each other in those pools and then um, where you finish in your pool, you play the, the team in the opposite side. So, uh, yeah, we've dragged together a pretty simple pool, I would have thought. Uh, England, Ireland and uh, Wales. So, you know, <laughs> I think we've got the easy side of the draw. But uh, fantastic for those guys to play, play those countries and then... Um, and, and, you know, Fiji's always, I'd say most of them, those teams are looking at Fiji going, great, I wish we didn't have Fiji because that, that's what Fiji offer so much uh, uncertainty when you play them. You know you're going to have a sore body and, and hopefully uh, in terms of the skill level, a few less yellow cards, we can get a couple of wins. So um, really good. Uh, obviously, with as you talked about, the, pad, uh, the virus going around, it's sort of... Uh, Makes footy a little bit sort of, we don't know where we're going, but at the moment it looks like we're, we'll all go for this, so it'll be great. Yeah, it'll be awesome. And, you know, last thing on Fiji, there's um, obviously you and the coaching team, um, a lot of Kiwi-based guys, and you're probably starting to put together a bit of a plan. You hinted a little bit about your role being um, about the kicking. It's probably about the accuracy of kicking at goal. It's probably is it a little bit about contestable kicks. It's probably a little bit about exits, making sure you exit well all the time. Is it those things plus maybe a little bit of set piece as well that get those things right and actually Fiji could um, turn some close w- losses into close wins, like there's that much potential with them. There is, and if you looked at the set piece, I think if we just touch on that, I mean the set piece has improved immensely. Uh, Alan Muir uh, was their forward scrum coach for for a few years and really did a great job with them, but uh, having someone like Jace Ryan coming in with a yeah. Crusader background that he's he, he knows how to win, doesn't he? So it's uh, fantastic to have someone from the Crusaders involved and the Crusaders have always been a good breeding ground too for the odd Fijian that come over and, and just become superstars. So, uh, you know, Jace knows how to deal with that and, and, and to go forward with that would be fantastic. But uh, you talk about uh, the sort of kicking game, I think they kicked at 41% conversions in the World Cup, you know, and that that's probably 20, 30 points at the World Cup missing. So if you can just get that to 75%, automatically they could get that odd loss, close loss to a win. So there's certainly improvement around that area and... Um, and uh, they're never short of line breaks, Fiji. You know, I, I think they're the highest line breakers in the World Cup, but uh, just didn't, didn't get it over to, to scoring tries. So that, that's another area if we can just let them be Fijians and offload and play foot, great footy, but just to, to make sure they finish off those uh, those moves. Mate, it's, it's an exciting gig and looking forward to um, seeing them play once it gets going. And lastly on Fiji, there's the Pacific Nation Cup. That'll be picked predominantly from people in this part of the world, won't it? And you've got boots on the ground, is it, um, with the director of rugby over in Fiji? Yeah, Big Sai, who was, um, I played with him at Saris, uh, Sai Raluni, and, you know, fabulous guy, 150 kilos, like, just, you look <laughs> at him and whatever he says you do, because he's just a big, powerful man. Uh, he then became head coach at Racing Metro when they came through in, in France, uh, and then he was the Wallabies Ford coach. So his background is phenomenal. And, and I think Fiji are extremely lucky to have him as in the high performance role. Um, he took them to the World Cup a few years ago and played really well in it. So he's Fijian through and through. And to have someone like that with the experience of travelling around the world um, and his connections around the world is phenomenal to have him based there. And uh, with a few trainers over there. So, that, that you know, we, we all know that to play footy these days, you look at it, you've got to be really fit. So to have a couple of good trainers based in Fiji, and hopefully we can start flying, you know. We, we want to get over there and get into it. Uh, we're lucky Vern lives in the bay, um, Daryl Gibson lives in the bay, and I live in the bay. So it's quite good that we can at least get together as a coaching staff and, and start nutting out a few things. That's awesome. And, mate, moving to rugby today, Super Rugby at the moment, we've actually only got a couple of rounds to go. But um, this year you're not on the whistle, so you've been watching um, from the cheap seats. You've been joining the competition? Oh, it's unreal, isn't it? I mean, the, the footy is just different level. It's... Uh, the intensity, the speed, the accuracy of the players, what they're putting their bodies through is just unreal. And, and and you know we all want it to carry on, but we've all played footy too, and you can't just you, you gotta you gotta feel for the boys that uh, 
uh, you know, it's what is it, a 10 week competition, but um, there's some sore bodies. But just watching it as uh, Sunday footy, fantastic, mm. you know, sitting on the couch, get to watch it with your kids, which, uh, you know, I really feel like we've missed in New Zealand for a long time where you, you could actually sit with my 11 year old and watch some superstars play footy, which at 7 30 at night, you know, we'd let them watch the kickoff in the first 10 minutes and bugger off to bed. So, you know, three o'clock on a Sunday, I reckon, is just phenomenal. And, and getting kids back into footy. Yeah, absolutely. It's fantastic to see the crowds back in there as well. The crowds like when you played, mate, back in the, the late 90s, early 2000s, the super rugby crowds that are rivaling um, those days. For sure. And I, I hear, you know, they're already 33,000 sold for the Auckland Canterbury game, the last game. Wow. You know, and it's a week, a week and a half away and the competition could be over. So, you know, I'm going to it. I can't wait. And it's... Um, the crowds are phenomenal, and, and you know it's credit to New Zealand, really, isn't it? That you look around and all these major sports playing with no crowds, and you, you see Super Rugby with the, these full houses, just awesome. It is unreal, and there's um, like it's just the thing that's really stood out for me actually. It's probably being led by the Blues, to be honest. Even though the Crusaders are top of the table at the moment, it's just their their contact work, just their contact work on D, and then at breakdown time, they almost back to the the old school Auckland team of the eighties and nineties, who are massive men. Um, who really imposed themselves on the game? You were impressed with some of their some of their forwards in particular. Oh, mate, the tight fives, unreal, isn't it? I mean, um, we talk about how well nine and ten are playing, but they're just getting just all delivered on the front foot all day long. With uh, Patrick Tupelodu, I think's just gone to a different level. You know, he's, um, he was always probably third or fourth choice lock in New Zealand, but he's really pushing for a starting berth. I think in terms of the way he's playing, uh, big offer, just smoking dudes, and it's just awesome, mate. Eh? So. Um, I think, you know, uh, it's really good, like you said. I think they're really fit. Um, yeah. Leon's obviously done a really good job, but I think Tom Coventry deserves a massive, you know, tip of the cap in terms of what he's done with that four pack. Their line out's sharp, their scrum's dominating, and, um, you know, it's a shame probably that it is if the Crusaders obviously win uh, against the Highlanders, it's probably all over, but, you know, just a little bit longer, maybe even a final, what a final that would be. So, uh, Really impressed to see it. Good Fijian at number eight too, so uh, I'm sure he wanted to come back and play for Fiji if he not put it selected by the All Blacks pretty quickly, but uh, no, they're going real good. No matter what happens this weekend, um, that's a cracking game to finish the whole competition with the Blues versus the Crusaders. The um, Whether they're champions or not, the Crusaders come the last round, they're both going to want to absolutely knock the crap out of each other, aren't they, in front of potentially a full house. What a way to finish. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's the Crusaders have been the Crusaders again. You know, they just uh, we talked just talked about the Blues quickly there about how good they've been, but the Crusaders, you know, they just uh, I think they've gone to a different level again this year in terms of uh, how they're finishing games. Like you know, you always feel like you're a chance against the Crusaders, and every game is sort of fifteen minutes to go. It could be anyone's game, and the Crusaders end up winning by twenty. A lot of those games have done that, and uh, you know, obviously Rays has done a hell of a job there. But uh, I think Richie Mawanga, the way he's playing, is obviously he just he just turns it on for the last fifteen, doesn't he? And just uh, tears teams apart. So, yep, they go they're going real good. But yeah, they couldn't have put the competition any better to have those two teams on fire on a Sunday Arvo at three o'clock. Hopefully, the Auckland weather puts it on and in a full house. And uh, you know, it's just going to be massive. Totally. And to ask you a few questions about um, your old gig, your old area of expertise, Jacko. Um, you know, there's always every week there's always um, a bit of chat about. Um, the different refereeing rulings but um, one thing I wanted to ask you a little bit about going a bit of detail on is scrum time I almost feel sometimes um, the default uh, comment around scrum times is oh who knows you know like um, oh who knows that, that's just a big old mess there no one really knows um, and the ref's guessing sometimes you even heard that said a little bit but you know in talking to you over the years that's not the case at all in fact the ref's um, have a pretty good handle on what's happening at scrum time and what are some of the things you're looking out for so that we can give the viewers at home also a few things um, to watch for um, to sort of understand what the refs are looking for at scrum time? Yeah, I think we'll start, first of all, scrum time at Super Rugby probably hasn't been an issue because the skill level's been so high, so there actually hasn't been a lot of scrums. And mm. and when New Zealand teams play each other, I think uh, they're all pretty much coached the same way, so that, that helps because... Um, they want to scrum to win the ball. They don't want to scrum for penalties, so that helps a lot. But I, I think in terms of a referee um, area of the game, it's probably one of the biggest work-ons that referees do because, as you see, there's not many props running around refereeing the game. So they, they actually have to do a fair bit of work. Uh, a couple of good things is obviously the tight heads binding is, is what something you looked at mostly around uh, getting the elbow high and you know being strong in a position and then working a little bit on the loose head of how they uh, then are dominated or folding in. So it's... um. 
it's, you know, I can totally see why people think it guessing because both props normally come up shaking their head no matter whose penalty it is. So they don't know what's going on. Props do. So uh, <laughs> it's, uh, most, of, most of the time it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's certainly an area that I could definitely say would probably be running at 80%. There's definitely a 20% thing where they're probably a little bit wrong or could have been either way. Um, but the worst thing we want to see is plenty of resets as well. So sometimes a good old penalty is a good way just to start the game again. So um, I think, like I said, when it comes to New Zealand footy, we're pretty lucky in terms of what the pro- uh, process of a scrum is because someone's knocked the ball and it's a restart play. And I think that's how New Zealand teams deal with it. So it helps a lot with uh, their positive attitude. And, mate, over the years, um, now that you've hung up the whistle, um, professionally anyway, is there uh, any particular rules you'd like to see in the game? Um, you know, as someone who's um, specialised in it for over 10 years, is there anything that a rule change or, or something that, that you'd love to see brought into the game? Yeah, I, I think the breakdown still still can be a hell of a mess, you know. Like, uh, we probably have two, 180 to 200 breakdowns a game, and, and, and you know, it's a, it's a big area of the game. People talk about the scrum, people talk about the lineouts, but we probably sometimes have eight eight yeah. scrums a game and we have 200 breakdowns. So, you know, what's the hardest area to referee to understand is, is the breakdown. So I, I would love to go back to just the tackler being the old, the only person being able to turn the ball over. So if a tackler's good enough, you know, like you look at your mate Richie, how good he was about beating the breakdown, making a tackle, getting to his feet, turning the ball over. If that was the only person that was allowed to do that, really easy to see as a referee. You can clearly see he was a tackler. You can clearly see him getting to his feet and turning the ball over. The real issue comes when you have a assist tackler on an arriving player who then start beating rucks. Did they beat rucks? Um, is there, are they supporting their body weight? So if we had the tackler being the only person to be able to turn the ball over, everyone else, I, I would think, would arrive at the breakdown higher, and yeah. then it's just a pushing contest. So for, for a player, it's easy to understand. I mean, you understand if you're a tackler, you're allowed to go for it. Uh, otherwise, everyone else is pushing. And for a referee, for a punter watching, I think it's, it just clarif- uh, clears up so many issues around hands on the, on the ball making a mess. So I'd love to see that. I know we've we've sort of gone past that, I think. I don't think that would ever come back in. But uh, just something that could make it easier to referee and then for people to understand would be would be ideal. Well, it's a very influential podcast, Jack. I will get that to Bryce Lawrence or to World Rugby. I'm sure you'll see that <laughs> brought in next season. Um, North-South, uh, I think already sold over... Over 30,000 tickets, pretty exciting really, um, and again, because of the circumstances this year, it's an opportunity to play a fixture we haven't played before. Um, I know you haven't played um, back when you were a professional rugby player, that fixture wasn't there, but you did play, was it a, a trial? Yeah, well, it used to be uh, when I was there in 99, I think, or 2000, was the All Blacks played a New Zealand A team, so that was, uh, I don't know, I think I got in through some injuries or something, you know, you know what happens, an All Black got injured, everyone got dragged up, and then it was like, who's left, so... Sort of got dragged into that game. It was unreal at the old uh, Lancaster Park, our full house, and, pl- and playing the All Blacks was, <laughs> you know, different level. So uh, we, we we went all right, but obviously lost. It would have been a bad look if we won. So, uh, but the North South, you know, awesome. I see six sixty and now playing half time too, that's man. Right. So that's that's worth going on its own. So. Exactly. Um, Hopefully they'll uh, drag half time to twenty minutes though, because you know <laughs> if I'm going, I'd rather see twenty minutes sixty six sixty at half time, a bit like Super Bowl. So. Uh, it's a good setup. Uh, I know there was a lot of work or, or understanding of where you came from to be in the north south. Maybe that they didn't that get that quite right. I don't think because it was your first provincial union, wasn't it? Yep. So there's a lot of guys. Bodie, uh, Geordie's playing for South, isn't he? Instead yep. of being a Taranaki boy. So, uh, but it's about having the best players on the field as well. So um, yeah, another great um, idea by New Zealand Rugby, and I'm sure that will get a like you said a full house and and, and be awesome to watch. Mate, and uh, just, um, I know you, you did meet him a few times, I went away on a tour as well, but unfortunately last week we won, we lost one of our great rugby men really, um, not only a colossus for the All Blacks in the jersey, you know, playing 50 or 60 matches for the All Blacks, which during his era, you know, effectively is almost 100 plus, considering how many test matches they used to play. Then, um, success on Northern Hemisphere tours, 81 Springboks tour, Cavaliers tour, it's a hell of a career, um, big Andy Hayden. Um, you were lucky enough to meet him on a few occasions. Yeah, and you just rattle off what he's done, mate. There's so many other things he's done people don't know about, you know. Yeah. Like, I mean, look how who he managed and, and what he ran in terms of uh, pro, you know, promotional stuff. He was just a phenomenal bloke and, and lucky enough to go to Bermuda with one of the classic teams and um, 
just the way he got the guys together and the people that wanted to play just because it was Andy Hayden, you know, and uh, and uh, rugby was really important, but uh, golf was just as important <laughs> for him on that tour. Having fun was even more important, and um, you know, just just an unreal bloke, and uh, you know, a, a big loss I think to to not only um, New Zealand and and what he's done, but the rugby as well because he's, he's he offered so much. So uh, you know, I, I heard it was a phenomenal uh, funeral. Lucky enough uh, to coach his great nephew, and um, his old man was a pallbearer there at the funeral, and just said, uh, you know, the people that turned up to show his respect was. Uh, was right and um you know a massive loss to, to, to new zealand and new zealand rugby mate to talk a little bit about yourself jacko and and start with your your playing career and it's you know something that doesn't happen perhaps as much as it used to but came through a non-traditional rugby school otomodai college um fantastic to see you be able to come through and play professional rugby um from there um some of the some great memories at oats Oh, good school, good school. Uh, t- very poor rugby school now. Um, <laughs> we were lucky. Bryce Lawrence, actually, he's an old Otomoto boy too, and he's he's putting it together. He's actually coaching the first 15, so I'm not sure that's going to improve them. But uh, he's certainly uh, a good man to try and get a bit of uh, – he loves code, Bryce. So um, to, to see rugby trying to get back to being a, a, where it was because, you know, we need people playing. It's, it's, I think it's the second biggest co-ed school in New Zealand, and their first 15 joins with Bethlehem College. So it just shows you – you know, it's just a, such a shame that a, a school like that can't have its own first, first 15, but we've got people trying to do it. So some really good fun. Um, we had a pretty good first 15. First, uh, never beaten Tarrant boys in the history of the school, and we lost by three points just because a big man-child, Royce Willis, he actually ran over all of us, and he was too big. He shouldn't have been allowed to play. But uh, uh, good school, mate, and, and just lucky, I suppose, to be picked out uh, out of that school to play for Bay. Bay of Plenty Secondary Schools because, you know, I don't think it would happen now these days. Like, you play for a little school like that and you wouldn't probably go into the next level of, of rep footy. So um, Duncan Dysart, the old Waikato coach, took a punt on me and, and it started from there. So um, great school and, and, and a good way to start the career. And again, um, a lot of today's professional footy players don't end up playing a huge amount of club footy, but, you know, you're at a, you're at a time um, where... There still was an opportunity to do that, and and went straight out from from Oates into senior footy. Was it that would have been a learning experience? Yeah, first game uh, Rangiru in Tupuki, <coughs> and uh, people know Tupuki. She's a she's a cultured little town, great little town. But uh, yeah, I remember I was eighteen, so I was still at school. But on the dead ball line, uh, big scrum, um, and behind me, I think it was about seventy six mongrel mob still on their bikes sort of telling me I was uh, not that good of a player and uh, they were right. I uh, absolutely uh, crapped myself and I think the ball went dead from my kick and I got out of there. But uh, really good back there, you know, you played with All Blacks. Um, went from Taranga Sports uh, over to Hamilton to do Teachers College and played for Hamilton Marist, you know, and, and outside me was Matthew Cooper and, and um, you know, the team was full of full of either Waikato or Chiefs players or All Blacks, you know, and... To, that doesn't really happen anymore. I'm sure it will happen a little bit more now with what's happened with COVID. But, uh, you know, just great, great to, as you know, club footy is everything. Mate. We're, we're affiliated with Tapuna down back home and the crowds they get there and, and um, the support that that club's getting, you just it's great to see club footy really, I think, getting a bit of a second drive in terms of uh, the support it's getting. And it's, you know, it's not necessarily better or worse, but for you as an 18-year-old to be able to play, you know, with grizzly old men was probably... An important part of your rugby education. It was probably great to get in there with some of those um, really experienced professional players. The opportunity to play with them at club rugby had to be a big part of shaping you massively. And and back then, um, again, you, you you certainly understood how people could throw a little punch and break someone's nose in a <laughs> ruck without a ref seeing. It was uh, it was proper rugby back then. You know, you'd, it was the old days. You'd get back in the shower and say, "Look, boys, I'm a team, but I've got their ruck marks on my back. Did it for the team, you know." And and boys were just beaten up, but they'd. They'd go back and have a beer and with the opposition. And, and, and the great thing that I learned back then is, you know, you'd always have a beer with the ref and yep. have a good chat and talk about the game with each other. And it was, um, yeah, it was just a great way to learn um, the old tricks, I suppose, of, of, of playing with guys who were probably th- late 30s. You know, I'm 18, you know, so 20-year difference of understanding life and, and not only rugby but everything else that comes with life in terms of family and, and uh, how to be, how to, just how to be a good human being. And was it for the first class side of things? Did you actually make your first class debut for the enemy? Is that right for Waikato? No, uh, lucky enough to play second division for the Bay back then. So uh, one season there under young uh, Andy Miller. So he was 
pretty class class ten, and again learned a lot from him. He he was with the Crusaders for the first couple of years down there, and uh, and then I went to Hamilton to go to teachers college, as I just said, and I was still going to come back and play for the Bay. Uh, but John Bow asked me if I'd want to play for Waikato, and you know the Bay was still in the second division, and Waikato in the first division with a rock star team, you know. So it was a was a an easy decision, but then I had to ring Gordon Titchens, who was the coach, and say, mate, uh, I'm not coming back to training. And uh, it was probably the toughest uh, phone call I've ever had to make in my life. Uh, certainly didn't miss his trainings, that's for sure. But, uh, you know, Titch was a, you know, he was a, s- a strong man, good coach, and, and that was a pretty scary moment to say, mate, I'm off to a first division club and, and thanks for everything, but uh, stayed away. So it was good to play for Waikato uh, back in those eras. You know, we had the Shield for three years, I think, and, and just great men. You know, um, sponsored by Waikato, so a lot of free diesel. It's probably because that's all they could do with it. Uh, and then, and then, lucky enough to go back to the bay once they sort of got back into the first division. So it was uh, good to finish back in New Zealand, back in uh, the home province. For Waikato, was what sitting beside and behind Fozzie on those days? Was it like that yep. was that was almost their their heyday, Waikato, wasn't it? Through that period, it was. Yeah, lucky. I mean, Fozzie was uh, one of the best captains I've ever. Ever run around with, um, you know, he was a good team, but uh, the way he led our team, you can understand why he's the All Black coach now. You know, so um, you know it's always tough backing up uh, the uh, All Black uh, coach. Hence why I probably once he became coach, I went back to the Bay because uh, thanks very much, <laughs> mate. But uh, you subbed me too many times, so you're out. So uh, <laughs> it's um, it was good to learn from him, and um, you know, and uh, Scott McLeod obviously was at running around twelve, so he's in the All Black Cynics coaching setup and. Uh, some some guys have who have finished that um, team and then gone on to coach to high level is just to understand the the knowledge probably floating around that team at, at this stage. But it was you know you, you saw the light got back over the Kaimais and and put on the steamer jersey and it was probably that period where you won the shield and defended shield that you'd probably have to look back on with the fondest memories in your rugby career. Uh, very easily the fondest memory. You know, um, uh, again, extremely lucky to be coached by some. Yeah, some which turned out to be two rock stars and and Vern Cotter and Joe Schmidt. You know, like uh, when they got pulled together as a sort of young coaching team. Who would have thought? You know, they'd go on to coach Ireland and Scotland as well as they did. So, uh, you know, it was good to have them because we had we as the as the Bay always is. We sort of pulled together a few people that no other clubs wanted. Rua Tapoki got pulled, and I think he was on a weekly contract because it was sort of like mate don't let yourself down and <laughs> and Rua, Rua was unreal uh, Adrian Cashmore came back he couldn't walk but he was put, put back at fullback uh, you know so guys who who loved just playing for the Bay it was, that's what it was about it was it was never about ever turning up for a contract of money I mean um, I know when I was in the Bay I was five grand for the season you know if, imagine that now so uh, just to play and then to win the Shield against Auckland was, was awesome but then the f- next week uh, the greatest game I've ever been part of was uh, we had to defend it six days later after being on the piss the whole week and then uh, defended against Waikato and if we'd lost we would have been the shortest tenure ever so to lose to Waikato and be the shortest tenure was uh, a fair bit of panic on us full house <laughs> at Bay Park but to beat them with their rock star team was, was the best day of my life so it was great Yeah and then you are uh, almost hung up was it a or it had a penalty almost to beat Canterbury to hang on it even a little bit longer? And when you when you think about that, take it off Auckland, defend it against Waikato, particularly at that time, and then to almost beat Canterbury for the Bay of Plenty in the early two thousands. Shit, that's a fantastic run, isn't it? That which shows that you boys were able to pull together something pretty special over a couple of months. Yeah, it was, and uh, you know Canterbury turned up. It was virtually the All Black. So like the good thing is, I think as a team, I, I, I rattled off two guys, but uh, Rua. Adrian, Kevin Senio, you know, we had a couple of guys that were just strong, uh, Wayne Orman, Unreal, uh, Paul Tupai, so so some senior guys who played a lot of footy, so we sort of turned up against Canterbury and uh, actually believed we had a chance, which, you know, is half the battle against Canterbury, especially back then, Justin Marshall, they dropped it over the line and was awarded the try, <laughs> Paul Honus, good work, and then uh, last play of the game, we got a line break, uh, Adrian Cashmore made a line break, had Grant McCord outside him, and probably the right option was to give it, but he did the old chip kick, and I'd, I'd think uh, Grant McCoy's a fast runner, and I would have thought all day long he scores. We draw and keep the shield, um, and Critter Blair, Ben Blair uh. turned, and the gas, I've, I've never seen the gas from a guy turning, an outrunner guy who was running next to him, was, uh, and he got it down just on full time, otherwise we would have kept the shield for the for the summer, but uh, 
Mate, holding the shield was quite tough too on the old liver. So uh, the boys, <laughs> the boys had three good weeks with it, and it was uh, it was good to good to enjoy. Would have been good to keep, but a uh, good little era. And the two coaches, like you mentioned, become you know really big names in the coaching world now. That were they chalk and cheese, and that worked sort of thing. They seem like it from the outside. You know, Joe's the you know the very analytical character. Vern, like you said, maybe a harder man, to, but it seemed to work. Yeah, you nailed it right there. I mean, thank goodness I wasn't a Ford because those Fords got destroyed by Vern. But uh, the Bay need that, you know. Like, and, and as Bay players, they respected that. It's just been told what to do. Uh, the four pack enjoyed it, and we we got really good uh, purchase out of out of the guys being driven hard. And um, and Vern Vern did a really good job of head coach, um, and and the discipline he put in, and and the way we played, game plan was all, all uh, Vern, but. Uh, Joe, for me, is probably one of the best coaches I've ever had. Even then, he'd really go back to basics and work on your skill. And even, I think we turned up and we were sort of like, mate, we're not kids here, you know, like, Joe, what are you doing? But there was a reason behind it because I think when you go to that next level, people expect everyone to know their skill or the core skill and be able to do it right. And Joe wanted to make sure that it was done perfectly. And... Um, you talk to everyone in Ireland, same thing. It doesn't matter which level he's gone to. He really breaks down the skill that he wants you to do and perform. Uh, your running lines, uh, you'd get really put up on the on the spot if your running line, even if you're a dummy runner, wasn't doing what it was supposed to be doing. So his his detail was just different level, and um, you know it, it makes no it's absolutely no coincidence that he then became one of the greatest coaches for Ireland. Um, I know he's not coaching at the moment, but it'd be a real shame if he uh, he doesn't get back into some sort of team because uh, it's a massive loss to rugby, in my opinion. Um, hell of a nice bloke, and uh, what he does for footy, I think, is amazing. And, and um, you know, even for charities and everything, the guy's different level. So it'd be good to see him back uh, in New Zealand or somewhere who's certainly turning up in the coaching ranks again. Mate, and also, um, was it around 27, 28, um, you decided to do your rugby OE? Was that at the time... A tough decision because I've heard you say before, at that sort of age, uh, first fives can be coming into their own, you know, maturing, starting to understand their game. But you started to take your skills uh, offshore. Tough decision. Uh, it wasn't a tough decision when I signed uh, for Saracens, which was sort of the beginning of uh, end of Super Rugby in two thousand and four. Uh, but then we had that year at the Bay. Um, now I don't know whether it's you know it can be quite stressful back then playing for your contract all the time in New Zealand. Um, but it just sort of freed up that I was going away, and then my rugby sort of I thought that year uh, turned a corner in terms of just understanding the game. And you're right about being a ten. I think the 26 was a good age, 27, where you actually just understand your the way you can play. Um, so to leave and turn up at Saracens when I did, I was probably a little bit resentful that I, I was leaving New Zealand because uh, it was just it was just coming right. And um, so my first year at Saracens, I found pretty tough. We had four coaches and Saracens, you know, my first year. So I, I signed with Rod Kafer. Um, Kafe made a hell of a comment, didn't he, the other day about uh, New Zealand teams would, uh, wouldn't beat Australian teams. But anyway, he's gone big. Probably he why back. he got fired pretty quickly. <laughs> so uh, so he got fired as soon as I got there. And by the time of the end of the season, we had gone through four other coaches. So it was a tough, tough gig turning up as a 10, trying to uh, survive relegation. And in fact, we were pretty much relegated with... Uh, Three weeks to go, three games, and uh, the King King Eddie actually took over us for those last three weeks. And we won three games out of three to stay up, and uh, hence why uh, Eddie Jones has probably got houses all over the shop, especially with Saracens as well. So uh, <laughs> you know, so uh, it was great to finish with him. You know, it was my first sort of um, work ever with Eddie, and uh, just how he just got the team to play instead of just worrying about things was awesome. So. Uh, after that year, then it was the greatest five years. Loved it. Loved living in London. Had our two kids there. Uh, just so much going on. It was obviously not a rugby town, so it didn't. You know, rugby was as big over there, but it's not followed obviously like football. So, yeah. Once I got that first year of being pretty hard work, um, then realised like we're here. We're here now. Let's just play. And it was it was it was a great club to play for and some good fun. Because it is different up there, isn't it? Like there's, I've heard you say before, it's, it's three seasons in the one. It's a really long season. Um, the footy's different, but it's really, really well followed. Was was that first year, even though you're in the relegation zone, just a bit of a transition as well from New Zealand? You to try taking New Zealand style over there, Jacko, or or. Yep, and that's a big problem. Like Tane Randall uh, was in the team at the same time, sort of turn up, and I suppose there's a ten, and Tane was captain a little bit. 
you'd sort of try and get a better way of playing. And um, I remember Tane, who's you know very very intelligent footballer, very intelligent man, but he just he says stop trying to do it, mate. Like it's it's not New Zealand. And I didn't really get it. You're still trying to do it, but then the penny click. You know it isn't New Zealand. Uh, and you, you nailed it. It's three seasons and one. If you look at what New Zealand uh, rugby players do, they they used to play for their club. So that's one season. Then they'd go and play Super Rugby and then finish that quickly. Then they'd go and play uh, Mighty 10 Cup or NPC, what it was back then. And then if they got enough, they'd play for the Marys All Blacks or something like that. So you're playing for four different teams, four different coaches. It was a, it was a good chance to really get um, things just spruced up again. If, if, you go, if you were in a team that was struggling, you knew it was only going to be 12 weeks and you're back into another team. Whereas over there, same people, same coaches for 10, 10 months. And you're going through summer footy, Terrible winter footy, snow, back to some summer footy, you know, so it's a real, if things aren't right in that camp, she can be a long old 10 months, quick um, pre-season training, then you're back in it again. So real, uh, I love the setup. I mean, it's brilliant that the clubs are followed strongly, beautiful, intimate grounds, really, really good uh, understanding of how to play footy in, in different conditions, but uh, can also be a slog if, if things aren't done right. It was, um, you know, like you say, you went over, and when you first got there, you're in relegation zone. You've gone through four coaches. Um, but when you left, um, you're a finals team and, and playing really well. It had to be satisfying to to go on a massive journey um, with the team playing 30 games over the course of a season. Yeah, and learnt so much. Uh, had some great coaches. Uh, Eddie Jones, Alan Gaffney, who was part of the Australian setup. Um, Andrew Farrell uh, was there and obviously now with Ireland. Um Paul Gustard, who was uh, England defence coach. So we, Steve Borthwick was a phenomenal captain, uh, gone on to obviously coach with Eddie in Japan and England. So really good people come through, the, came through the club and, and learnt a lot. Uh, and as you said, for, from we, my first year to the last year, we lost our final in, the, in my very last game of professional, professional footy at Twickenham Full House, and then they won it the next two years. So to see what Saracens had done, from, from that time to, to now, uh, obviously there's been a few issues, which is a real shame because, I, I mean, you know, I, I truly believe it wasn't intentionally stuff that's happened, but they've got a phenomenal squad and people wanted to play for Saracens now because it, it was probably the first club that really drove the family. Um, they wanted their wives and women and kids to do everything with them and, and geez, they went on some great trips. I mean, it helps. You know, they had a couple of multi-millionaires looking after them, mate. So it certainly helps things. We could do a couple of them around... Round uh, Fiji, if anyone's listening, so that'd be good. So, but uh, no, it's 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 great to see the, the um, progress that Saracens had done over the six years. And you mentioned it earlier, you spent um, quite a bit of time with Eddie, and he's always someone who grabs a headline. I love it actually, to be honest. Um, you know how he's not afraid to get up and and throw a few bullets out there. But um, how was it being coached by Eddie? He's, he's obviously he's got to be a bloody good operator. He, he orchestrated Japan beating South Africa and probably the biggest rugby upset you know, as described by Sir Graham Henry, you know, he's obviously pretty sharp. Mate, he's just a workaholic. You know, he's, uh, he's 14, 15 hours a day in, in the club. Uh, he destroys his, his, um, some of his backroom staff, uh, but he just wants the best for everyone. And uh, what I really enjoyed him about him is how he pulled a team together. And um, he used his senior players probably better than anyone I've seen in terms of uh, having a team culture and, and understanding. Uh, he, he's tough work. But uh, he's, he's only doing it to want the best out of you. I mean, we, we had a couple of good Barneys, and that probably helped because I stood up to him one night after a reasonably good night on the on the, on the the Terps, and uh, I wouldn't have done it if I hadn't. But uh, the respect I think he had from that afterwards has, has been phenomenal, and um, and look what he's done, you know. Like, uh, as you said, around the Japan stuff, uh, phenomenal um, in terms of getting them where they did in Japan. And probably they've got the right coaches. I'm sure Eddie would have helped in terms of who took over, and, and they've obviously carried on that thing, which is, that's great to see for a country like that. But also, what he's done with England, a lot of people, we've always talked about England being the sleeping giant, and, you know, they've got the finances, they've got the players, they've got everything to, to succeed, but they just haven't. And um, and obviously, Eddie's the man to take them over, and and um, having some good coaches involved there, well, Steve Borthwick, as I said, I thought was one of the best coaches around, and he's obviously moved on to Leicester now, but... Uh, you know, I think uh, England's been lucky to have them, and and it's good for rugby, isn't it? That England are strong, um, and uh, as long as Eddie's around, they'll they'll always continue to be strong. 
You've got to be a strong personality in England, don't you? Because while we think you're under the spotlight here with the media in New Zealand because they love our footy, and there's probably elements of truth to that, it's in a whole other world in England. Like if it's um, if you're not doing well, then you're going to know about it. But you've got to have a strong backbone, and it seems like Eddie does. He's happy to get up, get up in front and take a few hits for the players and make sure the attention's on him and perhaps not on them, and probably exactly what England need because they look like a really confident team these days. Yeah, and he doesn't mind saying it, does he? I mean, he comes out in the media saying we want to be world number one, and that's great. Like, like Everyone wants to be, and quite often people don't say it. And he's come out and said it, and you're right, he will take the hit for the boys. You talk about the media in England being tough. I think not only that, the setup of England rugby is, is very different to New Zealand in terms of the clubs have a lot of say around how things are driven. Um, the players are paid by their clubs, very different to New Zealand, whereas New Zealand's, um, you know, a completely owned by New Zealand Rugby and the All Blacks. So the All Blacks are number one, so they get a say of when they get their guys. Over there, she's a bit of a bit of a fight around who owns the players in England, just pay for their players when they're in the England setup. So these windows that we're talking about in the media, people probably don't understand, but the, those windows are massive around working with the clubs and the, the clubs are paying these huge money for these international players, so hence why they don't want to always release them for test matches. So... You know, it's not only the media, it's a fair bit of politics around, and I think um, if Eddie's good at one thing, it's coaching. Politics is probably not always his best because he, he certainly ruffles a few feathers, which I think, you know, it's great it's great entertainment, and uh, but I'm sure not everyone agrees with that. Yeah. Nah, I, I definitely enjoy it. And you, as you were finishing your career, you're actually almost, did you almost follow, follow Eddie to Japan to do some coaching before you made the decision to ref? Yeah, I was lucky enough to be offered a, a role uh, in Suntory, which Eddie still has a fair fair bit of say around there. I think he's you know, classed as the sort of director of rugby, or, or he certainly, Suntory's his club, so um, he, he sort of rang me just after I'd signed for New Zealand with the refereeing about maybe playing one more year at Suntory and helping with a bit of assistant coaching there. Um, and, you know, that was probably, I remember sitting with Fiona going, oh, this, geez, what have I done now? I've come home for... 30,000 New Zealand dollars and should be <laughs> playing one more year of rugby and coaching in Suntory for, you know, that a week. So it's sort of like, what have I done? And pressure was on and uh, and uh, probably a little bit of regret for, for maybe a week and then uh, just realised, well, you know, I've just been, been in professional rugby for 12, 13 years. Uh, you're always part of a team. I think the best thing for, for me right now is just to understand, you know, what, and refereeing, we try and build a team, but it's it's all about yourself and it's, uh, it's, it's great to be... I'm glad the decision I look back now is, uh, thank goodness, because um, I think hopefully it's un- made me a better understanding of the game as well. Mate, and enjoyed it. You've now hung up the whistle. It's, hard, it's bloody hard to believe, mate, that you ended up you know, being a professional ref for, what, 10, 12 years or even longer. Um, loved it? Awesome. Yeah, like, um, you know, I loved everything about footy when you're playing as a team, but I think probably refereeing, Reffing's just as good, if not better. Uh, you know, the 80 minutes is hard work, really hard work, but it's good fun. Like, you still get the banter of, of players. Um, you know, people probably giving Aaron Smith a little bit of grief at the moment, the way he's dealing with referees. I thought he was phenomenal. Like, I loved his banter. He's so competitive. You know, you get to see some amazing stuff as a referee. You get to travel around the world. Um, it, was, it was a great, great time to be, to be part of it. You know, is it the easiest thing in the world? God, no, it's it's really, really hard. And as I said, the 80 minutes was great. The fallout afterwards can be can be really tough on the family, on everyone involved. Um, you know, you don't get a lot of say. Like, you, you're never really in a media conference about explaining what your decision was. Um, there's better things we could probably do to, to get our message across. Uh, look at every Super Rugby game. There's probably been one little moment that... Um, the referees probably got wrong, but that happens in every game. Just it just seems to be more and more under the under the microscope of of how's this stuff one game up. And uh, you know, I feel for these guys at the moment because the the footy is really tough. Uh, we talk about uh, World Cup. You know, probably being the hardest thing to be involved in. This would be way harder than the World Cup. You know, you'd, you'd quite often have uh, oh, the All Blacks playing Namibia or something. You know, which is an, a blowout. And you have a lot of blowouts in World Cup. You don't have blowouts in Super Rugby. So. Every decision at the moment's under the under the knife, and um, uh, but for me, it was it was just a great part to be to be part of the game in in, in that era, mate. And now, um, you know, gutted not to be a part of the the World Cup last year. Was that sort of was that the time you thought right? Um, that was the moment we thought maybe it is time to hang up the whistle and and look at other options. The coaching being the one 
that came through, or you were you intending to carry on a little bit, or, or when that that big carrot um, wasn't there anymore, that was the opportunity to to have a look. Yeah, I was uh, um, massively gutting to be uh, not in that World Cup. Um, sort of when I started, I wanted to go to the World Cup, uh, and was lucky enough to go to 2015, and to experience it in England was awesome. So to to, to go to 2019 in Japan was a real. I thought just uh, the chance I'd been riffing for long enough to really try and go as far as I can in terms of a quarter or a semi like that. So to get the news that um, I wasn't selected was really hard to take. Uh, but also you've been in rugby long enough, it's a selection thing. Mm. You know, what can you do about it? Like I sulked, I, 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 gave, <laughs> um, I gave the boss uh, a fairly couple of words that, um, that, I, that I wanted to do, and as you should do when you're, yep. when you're not selected. But... Uh, you know, then then you just get over it. It's like, well, there's no point dragging this on. I mean, I, I still loved what I was doing. I uh, got to ref uh, Mighty Tin Cup that year. It was awesome. You know, phenomenal final uh, to ref um, down in Tasman. And then um, and then uh, I wanted to do another year. So I really did. I signed for another year. New Zealand really good. I love the idea of refing. But uh, as I just said at the beginning, I've just had a the old body just caught up all of a sudden and um, had a hip replacement and that was the end of it. So it's sort of... Maybe it was a blessing in disguise that uh, you know that, that that this happened now because I'd otherwise I'd still be riffing in this competition right now. So yeah, New Zealand rugby were phenomenal around looking after me around this. So um, it was a shame because it sort of looked like it was a bit of a like a World Cup hangover. But uh, no, I was keen as to to carry on this year. So uh, but one thing happens, and then uh, yeah, lucky enough to if, if I was still riffing, obviously this Fiji thing wouldn't happen. So it's uh, sort of just you know fallen and fallen on my lap. So very grateful. Mate, it's awesome. And there's um, while we're waiting for the for hopefully an international schedule to open up, and and like you say, hopefully there is a Pacific Nations Cup for you to to get involved with soon. In the meantime, what are you up to? Is it looking after Peyton's team? Maybe a little bit of stuff with the local school. Yeah, no, Peyton's team's going good. Uh, one for one, had a buy last week, <laughs> so it was a bit tough. Uh, paid play. Um, we've got a lot of good mates uh, actually that float around the uh, under thirteens, like Daryl Gibson's boys play for Tapuki and Grant McCoy's a guy's a player, sort of similar age. So there's a fair bit of banter going on the phone. So Jason Spice, that little mongrel's kids running around too. So <laughs> uh, so in the meantime, uh, sort of like you said, waiting. Um, got a company called Roommate Cabins that, that, that deal with uh, cabins around the Rotorua and Fokatani and down south as well. So that's going that's going really well. So uh, if you need a cabin, Roommate Cabins, guys. Uh, but uh, just been uh, lucky enough to go on this uh, board for uh, Taranga Boys. Um, sort of uh, as I said at the beginning, it's a bit of the anti my school, but my boy goes there. Uh, and so we're putting together, uh, you know, rugby's pretty tough work at the moment for anyone. So in terms of uh, COVID and sponsors and what, so we're trying to put together this little lunch that we're looking for, um, you know, about 15 tables. I think we're up to 20 and looking for 25. Rowney, you're doing a great job helping with Head First as a charity. Uh, but also, you know, Sam Kane's kind enough to come and speak there. And uh, we've got Jay Reeves as the MC, which will be phenomenal. And James McConey coming along. So it's actually turned into some... Really a big lunch now, so uh, looking forward to it. Um, it's it's hard work, but it's really good fun, you know. Seeing people as soon as you put something together, and, and especially in Tearing, a bit of a lunch, and with you know guys can get on the booze, and girls have fun, and nice food, and a couple of good speakers, and a bit of laugh. Uh, you know, it's really opened up, and I think everyone's looking forward to it. And you know, it's a good way of trying to trying to ask sponsors to help out, but actually give something back to them in terms of having some fun. So that's going well, and um, yeah, it's, it's September the fourth, so uh, should be good fun. Mate, that's awesome, and um, you know, setting up nicely for the next stage in life, sort of Glenn Jackson event management, um, which yeah. um, uh, you know, um, seems like uh, that will be a success as well. But mate, thank you for joining us. Um, as you mentioned, it's a Super Rugby Wellness Round um, this weekend as well, so keep an eye on for that for on all the uh, Super Rugby and Super Club channels. I think there's a bit of a theme around handshake and connection, so um, do keep an eye out for this round. But Jacko, thank you very much. I know you're a busy man. You're on the. Uh, on Sky last night, giving your opinion there, and you've come in um, this morning to join us as well. I really appreciate it. Um, good luck for the luncheon. I hope it goes really, really well. 